Well, good morning, Barberville Baptist Church family. We're so glad that you could join with us this morning. Now, we wish that we could all be together as we do rejoice to do every Sunday morning. Uh, but circumstances this morning with road conditions and weather conditions just did not allow for that. Uh, but we look forward to being back together next Sunday morning uh, to be able to worship uh, with each and every one of you. Uh, on behalf of uh, Pastor West, Pastor Ben, and myself, we just want to let every one of you know how much we love you, how thankful we are for you. And also that uh, if during this time uh, with the weather and the snow, if there's anything that you need, uh, you need something done at your house, you need groceries, any kind of other help, you be sure to let us know so that we can help you and take care of those things. It is our joy uh, to be your pastors, and we look forward to, to serving you in whatever way we can. Uh, just this morning, um, I want to just take some time, and uh, those of you who may not be members of Barberville Baptist but are watching this this morning, uh, currently uh, we're still going through the book of Matthew. We have been doing so for uh, a little over two years. Uh, we've made it to Matthew 24. We've been looking at Matthew 24 over the last few weeks and still a few more weeks to go. And then uh, hopefully if all goes well, we'll wrap Matthew up um, at the uh, beginning or the, uh, at the beginning of the summer. And uh, looking forward to that and just bringing a culmination to what has been just a wonderful study uh, through Matthew's gospel, uh, but also looking forward to uh, some other studies coming up as well. But I wanted to take a pause on that this morning. Uh, just because of the context of, of how we're having to meet today, uh, and just uh, share a little bit from, from the heart. Uh, recently, I was listening to a sermon from a good friend of mine, uh, Pastor Jim Blaylock, and uh, Pastor Blaylock uh, is the pastor at uh, Beacon Baptist Church in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, it's the church that uh, when my family and I go on vacation that we uh, attend every time that we're there. Uh, we've been there uh, going on regularly uh, in January, about uh, 10 or 11 years. And uh, it really has become our church home away from home. And I really uh, love Pastor Jim and, uh, and his passion for the gospel and his, uh, his boldness in the pulpit. Uh, but this message that I was listening to just from a few weeks ago is kind of an end-of-year type of message. And he was talking about looking back um, at 2021 and looking forward at 2022. And at the end of his sermon... He asked this question uh, of those who were listening. He said, what did you do last year that will matter one second after you die? And I'm going to say that one more time. What, what did you do last year that will matter one second after you're dead? And I have to be honest, that question really kind of hit me in the gut, you know, and, and really there hasn't been a day since, and in all honesty, there's not been a day since I heard that message that that question has not popped back up in my mind and, and caused me to look both inwardly and, and outwardly at, at the things that I'm doing. What, what am I putting my hands to? What am I putting my mind to? What am I putting my efforts and, and my thoughts and my desires? How am I doing those things so that they will matter after I'm gone? That, that one second after I'm dead, when I take my last breath here on this earth and I'm in heaven with my Lord and Savior, well, I look back and be happy at the things that I had committed and given my life to. So as we look at that, we think back at, at 2021. If you could go back, what, what would you do differently? What would you do the same? What things would you change? And then looking forward, what do you want to do differently? How do you want to make 2022 different than 2021 was? And as Christians, you know, we clearly understand that the only things that will matter one second after we're gone are the things which we do for God. It's the things that we do for His glory. It's the things which we do in obedience to the things that He's commanded us to do. And if we're honest with ourselves, um, there's not very many people, I, I would say probably only the Lord Jesus Christ, who could look at His life and be perfectly satisfied with every single thing that they've done. Every single a moment of their life. Now, some people might be more. They, they've worked and, and committed and disciplined themselves, as Paul said, disciplining their own body, so that they can look back and say, okay, I, I'm fairly satisfied. But for many people, they may look back and say, you know what, I'm, I'm entirely unsatisfied with what I see in my life and the things that I'm doing, and I want to make those changes. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, then what do we do about something like that? Uh, how, how do we change that? What do we do? And I really believe there has to be a moment in, in the life of every Christian where when we understand the truth of the gospel, we understand the truth of what Jesus has said to us, what God expects from us, 
that we have to make a decision. Are we going to fully commit ourselves to the cause of the gospel? You know, it's really interesting as we look at Christianity in an American context versus Christianity in a worldwide context. Uh, for a very long time, now some of this is, is beginning to change in the United States over the past five to ten years, but for the longest period of time in the United States, it was very easy to be a Christian. And what I mean by that is not easy from the sense of what God asks or expects of us, but easy from a secular perspective, a worldly perspective. And you could be a Christian and, and nobody would make fun of you. You could be a Christian and didn't have to worry about keeping your job. You could be a Christian and really most of the time didn't have to worry about people of your members of your family uh, ostracizing you or kicking you out. But it's not been that way for much of the modern world outside of the United States, places like China, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and, and, other, and other regions across the world. Those people who are Christians, they know that when they profess faith in Jesus Christ, it's going to cost them something. It's going to cost them dearly. Uh, they're going to lose their jobs. They're going to lose their livelihoods. They're going to lose their family, their parents, their children. Everything could be taken away from them, but they're willing to do it because they understand the glory of Christ and they understand the truth of the gospel and how that is so much more valuable than even the most things that we hold most precious to here on this earth. But for American Christians, they've never had to deal with those things. They've never had to sacrifice those types of things. Then, as I said earlier, some of that's beginning to change. We're beginning to see as the culture becomes more and more intolerant to Christianity that there are times that people are losing their jobs because of their stance on, on the Scriptures and on what the Scripture teaches. Um, that there are times where people are being ostracized from their family because of their beliefs and because of the things that they believe. And so now, American Christians are now having to be brought to this thing. It's like, you have to make a decision. Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe that it's true? Do you believe that it's better than anything else this world has to offer? And are you going to cling to it and commit to it and do everything that God has called you to do? Because if you do that, you're realizing, not only by experience, but by testimony through the Scriptures, that it can and it will cost you everything. Now, the world is full of distractions. This, this seems to be the problem I, when I talk to people uh, that, that most affects their, their Christian world. There's so many distractions in this world. If we're going to commit ourselves to the gospel, we have to make sure that we make the gospel, that we make the truth of Christ, that we make his claims, his, his commands, the ultimate priority in our life. And there's so many things competing for that in our life. And not, not only is it family, is it work, is it friends, but then we have all the other things, right? We have social media, we have the news, we have hobbies, we have everything else that tries to creep in along the way. So we have to make a decision that we're going to prioritize our time. And that's why we see that in the scripture, this idea of, of committing and prioritizing and, and being not conformed to this world, but renewing our minds, uh, focusing our minds, training our minds, committing ourselves to the cause of the gospel. Because endless things are going to compete for our time. And, and endless things are going to be always be there. So we have to make a decision that we're going to commit to the things that truly matter. The things that will matter one second after we are gone. And as I begin to ponder that even more, as I said, that, that, that thought, that, that question had been continually on my mind and, and over and over for the past several weeks. Now, one of the joys of my ministry um, is uh, being able to teach our middle school and high school Sunday school class. I love spending time with those young men and women, and I'm oftentimes encouraged and challenged by the conversations and the questions that we have in that time together. And we've been going through the book of Acts, uh, because I think the book of Acts is a great place to start when you have young people who love the Lord and are committed to the Lord, because it just shows them the power of the Holy Spirit working in the early church and the amazing things um, that people did for the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit that the, the apostles had and the early church had is the same Holy Spirit that works in us and through us today. And he's still doing those same types of amazing things. He's still doing his work in saving people, bringing people to faith. And, and we can all be a part of that if we commit ourselves to it. So we've been going through the book of Acts. And, and in our study of the book of Acts, just uh, a week or so ago, we came across this passage in chapter 15. And uh, chapter 15 of Acts, verse 26, 
and it's uh, right after the it's in the midst of the Jerusalem Council, and we won't dive into the to the Jerusalem Council right now. We'll uh, we could talk about that at a later date. But in the midst of all that, they're they're writing a letter um, to the other churches and, and talking about what is being done at the Jerusalem Council. There was this issue with uh, whether Gentiles needed to be circumcised uh, in order to to become Christians or whether they had to abide by those things. And so they sent out a letter um, to to the to the Gentile churches with some requests that they had. But the one thing that I wanted to pull out in this passage is verse 26. They're speaking of Barnabas and Paul. And it says, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the descriptor uh, that they gave to Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the word risked there means to, to, to has given up or given over. So basically, what, what, what Luke here is saying in the book of Acts is that, that these men have given over their lives. They've given up the control of their lives. They, they've given it all over to the Lord Jesus Christ for the cause of his name and for the sake of the gospel. And what this meant was that they're no longer in control. So not only are they risking their lives in, in just daily livelihood, but they're risking their very lives even for the cause of, of, of losing their own life because they understood how great and glorious the gospel was. They understood the truth of the scriptures and they understood that it, it was worth even losing their own life if just one more person was able to hear the truth of God's word. And, and I thought about this, this description in light of that question. What things have you done that will matter one second after you're dead? And I think Paul and Barnabas could look back and say, we've, we've given up our lives. We've risked our lives. So now, not only have they done this, but everything about their lives was given over to the cause of the gospel. And this is, I think, what, what we need to grasp as, as 21st century Christians, is how do we live our lives in such a way that this same descriptor could be given of us, that we have given up our lives for the gospel. Now, this is not saying that, that every one of us as believers in Christ are going to be in a situation where our very life could be taken from us, although that could happen. But what it means is that we're willing to lay aside everything in this world. We're willing to lay aside every temptation, every distraction, even sometimes even willing to lay aside things that are, that are not sinful in, in and of themselves, but because they keep us from doing what Christ has called us to do. They keep us from doing what the gospel needs for us to do and being faithful and obedient to the cause of Christ. I just love the, the passion and the joy that you find all through the book of Acts. And as we were discussing this uh, in Sunday school uh, just a week or so ago and, and what this means, means to, to, to give up your life, to risk your life for the sake of the gospel, it reminded me of, of what had happened just in the previous chapter. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, uh, Paul was, uh, was in Lystra, and, and as they, the Jews came down from Antioch and Iconium, and they, they, they gathered the crowds together, they won over the crowds, and in verse 19 it says, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So they, they, they stoned him so severely that by all accounts, everybody thought Paul had died. They, they thought they had killed him through the stoning. So they drag him out of the city and they leave him there. And it says the disciples stood around him. He got up and entered into the city. And the next day he went with Barnabas to Derbe. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made, had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and then Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you didn't get what happened there, Paul was stoned so severely on one day that they thought he was dead. The very next day, he got up, went to another town, continued to preach the gospel, saw God move marvelously there, then went back to the place where he had originally been stoned, continued to preach the gospel. And the scripture says that it strengthened the souls of the disciples. It encouraged them to keep standing in the faith. Their willingness to risk their lives, their willingness to give up their lives for the sake of the gospel, not only was glorifying to God, but it encouraged the saints. It edified them because they saw the strength of their faith. This mattered to them. And it said, he said, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul was saying, it's all going to be worth it in the end. 
It's all part of what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes we're going to go through difficult seasons. Sometimes we're going to go through great seasons. But he said, even in the midst of those difficulties, he said, this is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Paul knew what it meant to live his life, giving up everything for the sake of the gospel. Because Paul didn't want to die and look back at his life and say, well, I wish that I had done more for the cause of Christ. Even though, even though I think any Christian, who, who even the ones who commit themselves, well, we will look back at the end of our lives and see that we could have had more opportunities to do things. But we definitely don't want to look back and say, well, I wish that I hadn't wasted so much time on this thing or that thing when I could have done more for the gospel. So I want to ask you that question today. What did you do last year? What are you planning to do in 2022 that will matter one second after you're dead? Let's plan our year around that question. Let's plan our attitudes, our actions, our decisions, everything about our lives. Let's be as, as Paul was, someone who has risked our life, given up our life for the sake of the gospel, and that every decision we make would be weighed with that thought in mind. Will this matter? One second after I'm dead. Will this glorify God? Will this bring honor and glory to him? Let's pray together this morning as we close. Father, what a joy it is to open up your word, uh, to study truth from your word. And Father, I, I believe to be challenged and encouraged by your word. Uh, Father, I pray for every person who may be listening now and may be listening in the weeks and months to come, uh, that Lord, you would help us to do as the scripture says here and to give up our lives to be willing to sacrifice ourselves and everything about us for the sake of the gospel father we want to be able at the end of our life to look back and lord to be satisfied with the things that we put our hands to with no regrets of how we lived our life that it was honoring and pleasing to you and we ask all these things in jesus name amen thank you again for being here this morning encourage you uh, to, even in the midst of snow, pick up the phone, call somebody you haven't talked to in a while, tell them about how good Christ is, share with the gospel with them, and we pray that we will see you this coming Sunday as we gather back together as the body of Christ. God bless.